Thank you, Jerry, for those kind remarks. And it's been a pleasure to get to know you over the years. Uh, the Ivy School has been, uh, you know, terrific, uh, a terrific place, and wonder wonderful colleagues, great people here, and uh, and you've chosen some pretty nice students too. They're nice people. And I want to thank all you nice people for coming out tonight. I know you could be in the pub <laughs> <laughs> studying, but uh, instead you're here, so bless you. I'm glad that's the case. Um, and uh, I am going to, I prepared some written remarks because I wanted to make sure that there was uh, some real value here. Uh, but I will ramble at the end of this and answer questions if you want, right? And talk to you a little bit about some other things that I've been up to. So um, here we go. Some are born great, some achieve greatness, and some have greatness thrust upon them. Now you probably, even if you've never attended a Shakespeare play, you probably know that, that line. It comes, of course, from uh, Twelfth Night, which we're doing this coming year. We have Brian Dennehy in the production, and you probably know Brian Dennehy from film and television. But he's also a two-time Tony Award winner, and uh, he's been inducted uh, actually just about a week ago into the Theatre Hall of Fame. And Twelfth Night, which is on our main stage, also has Steve Womet in it, and Tom Rooney, and Andrea Runge, and Sarah Topham, and tickets are available <laughs> at 1-800. <laughs> so there's the first lesson that I learned in my career in Shakespeare and Theatres. Never lose an opportunity to promote your business, right? But I don't really need to teach you that. Um, of course, you know, some people are indeed born great. But they're pretty rare. I mean, you think of someone perhaps like Mozart, who was incredibly talented at a ridiculously young age. Um, but I, as I said, that is quite rare. And uh, it's harder to come up with examples of people who have had greatness thrust upon them. I mean, one might think of perhaps Rosa Parks, who was a department store seamstress. And she was an active, but she was a relatively you know, unknown figure uh, involved in the American Civil Rights Movement until one day in 1955. She changed the history of her nation by refusing to give up her seat on a bus. And so in a way, that was a, a very pivotal moment of a leadership that was extremely personal. But when I think most of people, when we consider great leaders in their fields, like Shakespeare himself, we think of people who have in some way achieved that status by working at it over a considerable period of time. And we're naturally intrigued about how they did it. And perhaps even more intriguing than the journey up to the pinnacle of achievement, is the sometimes precipitous journey down. You know, we're fascinated by the fact that, that you can be the head of a major corporation or corporate empire one day and then be a convicted felon the next. And how do smart people make those kinds of mistakes, we wonder. You know, I've, I've learned a lot from leadership, from Shakespeare. I, I don't think I could have taken on my current job. Um, and I was trained as an actor, and I was an actor and a director, and, and for a while a producer before I began to take on the, the non-production uh, responsibility. So this was really a foreign landscape for me. And uh, so if I hadn't spent so much time on stage as an actor and speaking and listening to Shakespeare's language and to his thought processes, or in the rehearsal halls of director, trying to translate those words into action on the stage, I don't think I could have done what I, I've been doing over the course of the last 12 years. Working as an actor or director accustoms you to the process of trying to get underneath the surface, to recognize patterns, and to understand why things happen the way that they do. And having that kind of insight, I think, is essential to effective leadership. But you don't have to work in the theater to benefit from it. I mean, being an engaged audience member is also a way of cultivating some of that sensibility. You know, the best way to gain insight is from experience. And the theater offers us a very safe way of undergoing experience at its most extreme. Attending a Shakespeare play lets you get caught up in wars and revolutions and deadly dynastic uh, disputes without ever getting hurt. It's like a flight simulator. <laughs> it lets you be an eyewitness as people vie for kingdoms, commit murder, they take revenge, they plan stratagems that blow up in their faces, and at the end, you come out unscathed, but perhaps a little bit more aware of the challenges and complexities and ambiguities that attend any human enterprise. Human nature hasn't really changed in the last 400 years. At least I don't think so. I wasn't here that long. But we assume from what we see in these plays that we're seeing life as we can recognize it today. So things haven't changed since Shakespeare stopped writing for the stage. 
nor have the basic dynamics of the rise and the fall, conflict and resolution, the stories of human lives. So the more that you get to know Shakespeare's plays, the more that you'll see our own world reflected in them. Leadership is largely about the exercise of power. And power is a central theme in Shakespeare. And all of his history plays, from King John to Henry VIII, his Roman plays, Coriolanus, Julius Caesar, Antony and Cle Cleopatra, are all about aspects of political power, how it's obtained, how it's used, how it's misused, and how it affects the user, and of course, how it is sometimes lost. Shifts of power lie at the heart of the tragedies, too, from King Lear, through in which the title character makes a fatal mistake, of letting go of power while still expecting to receive the respect and the privileges that it commands, to Othello in which a subordinate, Iago, brilliantly uses the power of suggestion to turn his commanding officer into a puppet. The struggle for power is a significant theme even in the comedies, however, in which we think of as being more about love than about war <clears throat> or politics. It's central, of course, to the taming of the shrew, but it's there in all the other comedies as well. The action of As You Like It, for instance, takes place in the wake of, and largely the consequence of, a palace coup. The amiable Duke Senior has been deposed by his nasty brother, Duke Frederick, and has gone off to lead a government in exile in the Forest of Arden. And when Rosalind, Duke Senior's daughter, flees to find her father in the forest, she dons male disguise. And like other cross-dressing Shakespearean heroines, she's empowered by an assuming a male role. She can act with the freedom and authority that would have been denied to her if she'd stayed in a dress. <coughs> Hi. Oh, thank God. <laughs> you know, when you're in the theater, there's nothing worse than empty seats. <laughs> That's good. For a while there, Gerard, I thought you'd locked yourself out. <laughs> For those of you who are uh, just arrived, I want to assure you, you've missed nothing. Ask those around you. <laughs> talking a little bit about how <coughs> theater is a great way to experience and understand the complexities in life in a very safe environment. It's a kind of jungle gym for the mind. And that Shakespeare's plays, each and every one of them, whether the tragedies, certainly the histories, even the comedies, are about shifts in power. Now, Shakespeare remained preoccupied with issues of leadership and power to the very end of his career. The Tempest, which we believe to have been the last play that he wrote on his own, is, among other things, an extended meditation on various kinds of power. Its central figure, Prospero, um, is another ex-Duke who's been deposed as well by his brother. Shakespeare had this thing about brothers. Having allowed himself to get distracted from the practical business of ruling by his interest in the magical arts, which, we, being too wrapped up, you might say, in the life of the imagination, in his library. In the end, Prospero exercises what may have been the hardest power of all, to acquire, and that is the power to forgive. Perhaps Shakespeare's most exhaustive study of leadership is found in the two great cycles of history plays, four in each cycle, that together tell the story of how the Tudor dynasty, the family of his own monarch, Elizabeth, came to power. Shakespeare didn't write these in chronological order, like George Lucas, you know, with the Star Wars trilogies. <laughs> he did it backwards. I suppose that way you have the benefit of knowing the ending and writing the second cycle first, and then returning to the subject matter later to write the first one. So the first cycle of plays begin with Richard II, and then we get the plays about the reign of Henry IV, part one and two, and then we finish with Henry V. And then the second cycle, we get the three parts of Henry VI, and plus Richard III, okay? So don't worry, there will not be a test on this. I'm not gonna talk about all eight either. I just wanna begin to look at the first one. Now, Richard II is a prime Shakespearean example of an ineffective leader. He seems to have had no strategy. He has no clear idea of what he wants to use his power for, what he's trying to achieve. He acts as if the rights and powers that accompany his office as king were the privileges of his own person. He acts without regard to law, assuming that he himself is the law. And as a result, he makes arbitrary and impulsive decisions that earn him the enmity of the very people who support he should be working the hardest to cultivate, and that is the nobility, or his senior staff, you might say in business terms. One of the people he alienates is the man who will prove his downfall, and that is his cousin, Henry Bolingbroke. Now, Bolingbroke is as decisive and as clear-headed as Richard is vacillating and self-absorbed. 
and he launches a rebellion and he deposes Richard, assuming the throne himself as King Henry IV. Now to Richard, who still thinks he's God's anointed, the change in his fortunes is incomprehensible. He reacts to it by wallowing in self-pity. For God's sake, he says, let us sit upon the ground and tell sad stories of the death of kings. He calls for a hand mirror and gazes wistfully into it, asking, was this the face that, like the sun, did make beholders wink? Before smashing it on the ground, he goes so far as to compare himself to Christ, delivered to the cross, and indeed he ends up being imprisoned by the new King Henry and then inevitably murdered. Richard's problem is that he's a narcissist with a fatal sense of entitlement. He believes in what, he, what we would call the divine right of kings. The idea that if you were a king, you held that position because it was God's will. You were God's chosen, and you were the representative of God on earth. Now, I admit I've never actually heard anyone ever speak of the divine right of CEOs, <laughs> but I'm prepared to bet that there's plenty of leaders in the corporate world who subscribe to that very circular logic. You know, I'm in this position, Therefore, I deserve this position, and nothing I can do is wrong. But of course, it's not necessarily so. <laughs> Richard II is by no means a bad guy. Right? He's a very, um, he's, he's quite charming company, probably, at a cocktail party. He's imaginative. His language is gorgeously ornate. And in his own self-absorbed way, he is a philosopher. But he's in the wrong job, and he isn't shrewd enough to realize it. Nor is he able to play the part, and that's very important, to play the part effectively. There's an old theatrical joke that the most important thing to acting is sincerity. And if you can fake that, you've got it made. <laughs> Leadership is to some extent a role that you have to play, a persona you have to adopt. But the performance has to be very, very carefully judged. You know, Richard lays on the histrionics but he doesn't understand the essence of the role. He thinks it's all about him personally, rather than about being the office that he happens to hold. And like many a bad actor, he can't judge the effect that his performance is having on his audience, and therefore he goes too far. Bolingbroke, by contrast, shows contempt for putting on a show. Okay? He comes across as an absolute non-actor. And of course, that may just be because he's definitely better at faking it than Richard II is, at faking sincerity. For Bolingbroke, things are, work out well enough. He becomes, of course, Henry IV. He gets two plays of his own. And then he <laughs> dies. He dies peacefully in his bed, which, you know, in Shakespeare is a, is a hell of an achievement. <laughs> now, but there are dangers for the non-actors, too. Okay? The Roman hero, Coriolanus, discovers that in the play that bears his name. Now, Coriolanus, which I directed Colin Fiore in 2006, is about, a very, is about as different, this man is about as different from Richard II as it's possible to be. Okay? He's a consummate leader of men, at least in the field of battle. His, but leadership qualities in one field don't necessarily translate into another. And the tragedy of Coriolanus is that of a great military hero who makes a fatal mistake of going into politics. To get people's votes, he has to hit the campaign trail. He has to press the flesh. And he has to actually ask people. He has to ask them for their support. Now, if you think Michael Ignatieff or Stephen Harper lack the common touch, <laughs> Coriolanus refuses to even to attempt to manipulate his audience. He sees playing a game of politics as beneath him. He doesn't realize that the only leaders who survive, regardless of their sincerity, are those who master the art of political performance. He utterly despises the common people and can't bring himself to pander to them. He knows he's a better soldier than anybody else in Rome, and so the whole idea of casting himself in the role of supplicant for votes is anathema to him. And he makes a stiff, half-hearted attempt, but it's not long before his true feelings reveal himself, and he says, you common cry of curds. And he snarls this at the populace before going into exile. Now, Coriolanus is arrogant. And he has, indeed, every reason to be arrogant. But he can't grasp that arrogance is not a quality that's going to endear you to the electorate. His campaign is a public relations disaster. It's not that he's an ineffective communicator. Far from it. It's just that the message 
that he is delivering is unpalatable, and he doesn't know it. And the message is basically, you know that I'm the greatest warrior on earth. Why should I have to now bend down to you after showing so much merit to have your blessing as your civilian leader? Now, Coriolanus learns the hard way that leadership is, in fact, a contract. It's a contract between both sides, and both sides have to buy into it. It's not enough to be way better than other people at what you do. You have to want to lead people. You have to gain their trust. And you have to give them the ability to have some sense of self-worth and a sense of accomplishment in partnership with you. Rejected by his own people, Coriolanus ends up going over to his old enemies and joins them in an attack on his own city. And that proves to be an even bigger mistake because he's put himself in an impossible position where his loyalties are inevitably going to be divided. He's declared that he's going to sack Rome, and then his mother, Volumnia, and his small son and his wife come out and beg him to reconsider. So there's a lesson for those who who participate in political coalitions. Before throwing your lot in with your opponents, you have to try very hard to envisage in advance what kind of situations would be sticking points for your conscience. Mention of conscience brings us to another military hero, seeks a larger role for himself, and that's Macbeth. Macbeth is a prime Shakespearean example of the leader who sacrifices all principle in his pursuit for power and thereby plants the seeds of his own destruction. Like Coriolanus, Macbeth starts off as a war hero and universally praised and heaped with high honor by King Duncan for his key role in putting down a rebellion. But he becomes obsessed with the idea, planted in his mind by a very, very dubious trio of career counselors, the weird weird sisters, that he's destined for even greater things, the kingship itself. So that thought, coupled with the taunts and urgings of his wife, overcomes his better judgment, and he leads him to murder Duncan in his bed. Well, (laughs) you don't need me to point out the inadvisability of murder as a career advancement tool. But even leaving the killing out of it, the play offers a vivid illustration of the corrosive effect of seeking power for its own sake. You know, what Bolingbroke deposes Richard and causes eventually his death, he's at least trying to seek power to achieve an end, to turn around the country that he lives in, which has gotten into a sorry state under Richard. But there's nothing in Macbeth to Macbeth to suggest that Duncan is a bad or a weak king. Quite the contrary. In committing an act of assassination, Macbeth does not believe, as Brutus does with Julius Caesar, that he's acting in the best interests of his country. He's quite clearly acting in what he imagines to be the best interests of himself. So once he's achieved the throne, Macbeth's thoughts are not wither Scotland, but rather about consolidating his power base. To be thus is nothing, but to be safely thus And so ensues a wholesale termination of anyone who he suspects to be a threat. And I mean termination in the Schwarzenegger variety, not in the human uh, resources department sense. (laughs) Power, the old saying goes, tends to corrupt. But power is essential when it's a means to an end. It's when power is pursued as an end in itself that it becomes corrosive, sterile, and self-defeating. Any discussion of Shakespeare's treatment of the theme of leadership sooner or later gets around to the most obviously brilliant leader in the canon, who's Henry V. Now, unlike Richard II and Coriolanus, Henry V knows exactly how to get people on his side. He's a brilliant performer. He's a brilliant communicator. His speech rallying the troops before the Battle of Agincourt is one of the most famous set pieces, speeches in all of Shakespeare, and it's rightly so, recognized so. Henry scoffs at self-interest. I don't care about wealth. I don't care about status, he says, but I do care about honor. If we're going to die here today, he says to this group, he says, so be it. But if we pull this off and we survive, we will survive forever in the annals annals of history. (laughs) (laughs) It's a hell of a place to be. God, you are that vodka fabulous. <laughs> um, at Agincourt, which you know was a, an amazing battle because the English were so outnumbered, they were at number more than twenty to one by the French. 
um, they really thought they were about to die. And he says to them, he says, we few, we happy few, we band of brothers. For he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother. It's an extraordinary statement that for a monarch to say to a person that they will be his brother. But it's exactly what that group of fearful and dispirited and hopelessly outnumbered army need, needed to hear. That they were united by their leader, with their leader, in an enterprise that had the potential to be great. And all of us, on some level, want to be part of an enterprise that could be much bigger than anything else about us, even collectively. Henry goes so far as to tell them that if they don't want to be part of the battle, they can leave. They can have a golden handshake and go away. He says, I don't want anybody here with me today that doesn't want to be here. And so what he found was he had a group of profoundly committed people, even though the odds were crazy. Unlike Richard, Henry knows his audience, and he knows exactly the effect that the words that he's speaking will have. He knows in part because he's done his research. He spent time with ordinary people. Indeed, in the first parts of Henry IV, Henry IV Part I, Part II, when his father's on the throne, and he's just Prince Henry, he's he, Prince Hal to his friends. He's one of those bad boy royals. You know. um, the future Henry V spends his time hanging around in the taverns with the lowest of the lows. Right? And, and, and getting lots of publicity about this. Everybody knows about it. His father speaks to him about this. What hope do I have for you that are doing this? And, and thus, and this makes him the despair of his father. But as he confides to us in a soliloquy, he says directly to us at a certain point, and quite by surprise as you're watching this play, he says it's all part of a strategic plan. He says, herein, he says, will I imitate the sun, who doth permit the base contagious clouds to smother up his beauty from the world, that when he please again to be himself, being wanted, he may be more wondered at. So he's saying, I'm going to hide myself until that moment when I will reveal my true nature and therefore be more valued. Hal knows he's going to be king someday, and he knows that if the bar of expectation is set too high, nobody however brilliant, can hope to measure up to it. You might call that the Barack Obama syndrome. <laughs> so what Hal does is deliberately create low expectations for himself so that when he reveals his true magnificence as, as a king, he seems all the greater by contrast with his former playboy image. And even when he is a king, he continues to keep his finger on the pulse of his people. On the eve of Agincourt, in a great scene, he goes around the camp incognito. You know, when it, you'll find many paintings, Napoleon, about other great leaders being up in the middle of the night, the dark night of the soul before battle, going among the men, right, unable to sleep because they have the responsibility of the entire uh, kingdom and all of those soldiers on their, upon the king, as, Henry's, uh, as Henry V says. And he goes around to the different uh, soldiers and draws them out and finds out their true feelings about the campaign they're engaged in. This is very dangerous. Because you might hear a lot that you don't want to hear. Because he's hidden. He's not there as himself. He's there incognito. And I'm going to come back to this in a moment. So Henry, in other words, is the kind of CEO who never loses touch with the shop floor, right? He takes every opportunity to shoot the breeze with the employees, to get to know their names, to find out what makes them tick, to find out what's really happening in his enterprise. And Henry is a man of incredible ability beyond all question. You know, in 1989, I was an actor and I was playing uh, the kind of counterpart to this, this character in Henry V, the Dauphin of France. And, and I spent six months playing this uh, part opposite Henry V. And at every performance, I'd watch Henry V analyze and assess and act. And I'd see him deal with dissension. I'd see him deal with disloyalty. I hear him use language brilliantly to rally support. I'd observe him going out into the rank and file to learn what they were really thinking. I was reminded over and over again about the difference in terms of seriousness of purpose between Henry and my character, the Dauphin. The difference between mere, mere braggart and someone who's in touch with something far, far greater than themselves. It was an instructive lesson. So if you're looking for a role model in Shakespeare for effective leadership, look no further than Henry V. 
He has it all. And his reign is a triumphant success in terms of how to succeed in rallying others to your cause. Nobody does it better. But what about the cause itself? Is it beyond question? And if there are questions about the cause, what does that say about the proponent? Well, and here we run into one of the mysteries that we always encounter in Shakespeare. What does he really want us to make out of all this? Henry V seems to be, seems to be the hero of the play. But are we actually meant to admire him? Is he a force for good in the world? You know, there's an early scene in Henry V which has tremendous resonance for us in recent history today. He's conferring with the leaders of the church, right, and the, about whether or not he should invade France. Now, he remember that his title, because his father deposed Richard II and had him killed, is doubtful. The possibility of a civil war is very, very present. So he has an intention of invading France, and he asks the cardinals whether they believe his claim to the French crown is legitimate. And they do a very, very, very long kind of explication of Salic law and do a kind of genealogy of who begat who and showing why his claim is valid. And eventually, after about 60 lines, and I'm not kidding, of torturous genealogy, <laughs> he eventually cuts to the chase and he says, can I with right and conscience make this claim? And depending on how much impatience the actor shows, they may or may not get a laugh on this. Um, but the... Cardinals, of course, want him to invade because the church will stand to gain financially from the invasion. And he, they also are saying to him, and if you invade, people will not be fighting against each other here in England. They will be fighting against the French in France. But as you watch this scene today, you think of Colin Powell and weapons of mass destruction. You think of all of the reasons why we're supposed to go into Iraq, and there were many reasons why we we're all supposed to go into Iraq and fight, and you realize that this idea of trumped up or you know, uh, uh, a rationale for invading another country is not remotely new. In this scene, Henry's seeking the stamp of legitimacy for what he's about to do. He's about to invade France in order to give the people at home a common cause to rally behind, and thus to diffuse the potential for further insurrection in England. But is he truly concerned that this cause be legitimate, or does it only appear to be so? It's a question that Shakespeare leaves open. Now, let's go back to that night before the battle, where he's out, dressed up, and talking to his men. And he says to one of the men, he discusses how the king's cause is just. And the man says, wait, wait, hold it. I don't know that. I don't know if the king's cause is just. How am I going to know that? I just know that if it's not just, on the day of reckoning, when he goes to heaven or purgatory or whatever, and he meets up with those bodies that have been hacked apart and gets to meet the children of the fathers who've been lost and the widows, and he will have a lot to answer for. And that really sticks with Henry. He becomes very angry with that soldier because he realizes that the political gambit he's played is, for him, a major risk. He can die. But of course, it involves the lives of so many others. So actions, whether they're in the corporate world or in the political world, of course, have major repercussions. These are some of the uncomfortable things about Henry. At one point in his campaign, he's besieging a town of Carfleur, which refuses to yield. Now, he claimed that this town is a British town. Carfleur was claiming it was a French town, which raises not just, uh, you're not just taking another country's community, you're actually claiming that there's a civil war and people are denying the legitimacy of your claim to them, which raises the level of violence you can take against the civilian population. And he gives them an ultimatum. He says, surrender now or you'll be treated, and you'll be treated humanely. If you resist, I'll give my soldiers the right to rape, to burn you, to pillage you, and he says, your fathers taken by the silver beards and their most reverent heads dashed to the walls. Your naked infants spitted upon pikes. Could be bluffing, of course. But you don't get the impression that Henry is a person who does bluff. Perhaps Henry, Henry's ends are justified. And they justify, therefore, the, the means to them. 
If the worst thing that can happen in a country is civil war, or a situation where you have a neighbor fighting neighbor, fathers fighting son, then perhaps this foreign adventure is something that will prevent that and therefore is a legitimate thing to do. And therefore, maybe his reputation will survive spitting babies on pikes. But we're not sure those are his motives. And we don't know how far he would go. If you think back to the, that strategic role playing of his in Henry IV, when he hangs out with the likes of Sir John Falstaff, probably the greatest character in English literature, in the taverns of East Chief. And then you think back to his brutal repudiation of Falstaff afterward. He says, I'm going to leave these people behind, and he does. He cuts them off mercilessly. You realize he's a person who follows through in his word, and he, he could well do it here. But what does it say about him as a human being? What Henry does is certainly expedient, but is he being guided by any kind of moral compass? Practically speaking, he's good at ruling, but does he in fact have the moral right to do it? The question of who had the right to rule was a crucial one in, in Shakespeare's time. Hardly surprising given the historical evolutions and convolutions by which his own monarch had come to the throne. The desire for a legitimate heir had driven Henry VIII the endless series of marriages and executions. And Elizabeth's own lack of an heir threatened to open up a can of worms all over again. So questions of legitimacy, legitimacy are central to that last Shakespeare, the last Shakespeare play I'm going to mention, which is King John. King John, which I directed in 2004, is a drama of survival in a cutthroat world that could just as easily take place in the corporate corridors or in the political uh, lobbies of today. In many ways, it is a play about temptation. There's a core group of characters, and each, each of whom is offered something that he or she really wants. And to get the things they want, all that each one of these characters have to do is do something truly immoral. By the end of the play, most of the tempted characters do the immoral thing, and they're destroyed. But there are a couple of exceptions. And one of these exceptions, ironically, is a character called Philip the Bastard. No. <laughs> the name reflects his parentage, not his personality. <laughs> Philip professed himself to be guided solely by profit. When you first meet this young man, right, he's just trying to get ahead in the world. And there is a, a for those of you who know Lear, but it, this happens in many plays of the time, uh, bastards were considered uh, to be somehow uh, uh, morally suspect, uh, trying to get ahead, and so they would, in many plays, kind of, you know, manifest their wickedness, and we would enjoy their climb up and their eventual, you know, uh, uh, comeuppance. So he, he kind of begins the play that way. You think that's what you're dealing with. And he says, all that matters to me is profit. He says, gain be my lord, for I shall worship thee. And he makes fun of honor. He sends the idea of honor up, right? How ridiculous it is. What are you going to earn out of that? What does that really mean to us? And I found it's amazing to watch audiences with this because when he starts setting up the idea of honor and belittling it, people love it because they're, they're tired of the pompous use of the word honor by so many people. They realize that it's over. It's like a currency that's gone up too much in value and it needs a good pricking down, right? Needs to get rid of the bubble. And, and he does exactly that for us. But early in the play, he also says, I am I, howe'er I was begot. In other words, who cares if I was born on the wrong side of the blanket? I'm still me, and that's all that matters. So in the simple phrase, I am I, Philip the Bastard reveals a clear sense of self that can't be claimed even by Bolingbroke, right? Who is haunted all the way through his regime by the fact that he caused the death of Richard II, and that he wonders about his own legitimacy. Philip, though, is secure enough in his own self-knowledge that nothing else really matters. Nothing else can touch him here. And, and this is a world with King John, uh, who, remember, Arthur was the legitimate son of Richard the Coeur de Lyon, and he displaced him. Eventually, Arthur is killed. And King John is very much like Richard Nixon, you know? He, everything's going his way, and he manages, because of his insecurities, to screw it up. Um, so, ultimately, Philip the Bastard 
doesn't want anything so badly that he's prepared to do anything, however self-destructive, to get it. He's found a firm place to stand in the muck of the world. In other words, he has integrity. And he doesn't get to become king or anything like that, though he does pick up a knighthood early in the play. But even in his own eyes, that's not a measure of his success. Where he really triumphs almost everybody else is in, the, in this play is in the fact that he simply is himself. He does not try to become the king. He supports King John all the way through. And some really horrible things happen. You know, there's a scene where they try to remove the eyes of the young prince. And, uh, and it's quite interesting because in this play, Shakespeare usually takes words. He treats them very much a currency. Okay? And he will set these words up as targets and say they're overinflated. Honor. Legitimacy. What's that mean? Legitimacy. By the time you get to the end of this play and you watch this child eventually die after almost having his eyes taken out, you watch the horrible things that happen all the way through this. By the end of this play, you begin to understand what the word honor means. You begin to understand what legitimacy means. So in other words, no, it's not up here in value, but it has a value and even a little bit of a value this horrible world is an incredibly important thing. It's like a beacon of light. So let me go back to the words I started with. Some are born great, some achieve greatness, and some have greatness thrust upon them, to which we can add a fourth category, and some redefine greatness on their own terms. Not as wealth, not as public acclaim, or worldly power, but as inspiring examples of how to be the best we can be as human beings and what human beings might be capable of. Shakespeare's plays are full of characters who are or aspire to be leaders of one kind or another, and few, if any of them, are wholly admirable. And perhaps that's the single most important lesson to be learned about leadership from these plays. Treat it with a healthy dose of skepticism. Serious questions hang over even the most accomplished of Shakespeare's leader figures. But there's ultimately only one kind of leadership that I think emerges from Shakespeare's plays without taint. And it's not the kind that necessarily leads to glory, or worldly power, or wealth. It's the moral kind of leadership that you see in Philip the Bastard in King John, or Cordelia in King Lear, who loses everything to tell her father the truth. Or Prospero in The Tempest, who despite having every reason to bring about revenge, instead brings about harmony and forgiveness. Or Hermione in The Winter's Tale, who is outrageously treated and loses her child, and, uh, but handles all of that with dignity and with enormous grace. Such characters are our beacons in the darkness of the universe. And if there's a single lesson about leadership to be drawn from the works of William Shakespeare, is that through, is through the acquaintance with those characters and their kin that we will find our firmest ways, way through the mazes and the thickets of the world so um, I know that that didn't quite draw, address the issue of what Shakespeare would have thought of the latest financial crisis. But, but uh, um, I, I wanted to sort of give you that overview of the many different kinds of examples of leadership. Um, we can open up to questions now. Maybe in the, and within that context, I'll talk a bit about El Salvador and culture days. Yeah? Oh, thank you. Okay, thanks. Thank you.